Hello and welcome to another episode of The Housekeeper's Diary and it's episode number nine I believe so we're really ripping through this book. I have enjoyed reading your comments so much and it's very exciting because as this series gets more popular and as it grows and as the channel grows, don't forget to like and subscribe, that was a quick card sell, um, we're hearing from people who have actually met the royals, who have interacted with them more than once and giving us a bit of tea giving us a bit of tea in the comments so it's very very exciting so make sure you read them I also think it's amusing that uh, people think that if I criticize Diana um, that I'm on team Charles and if I criticize Charles I'm on team Diana and if I criticize Fergie, I'm somehow comparing her to Meghan Markle in some way. I get all this whataboutism about, oh, well, at least she didn't do it. Look, I get all that. There's always layers and complexities to everything. But all I'm doing is I'm sharing my reaction in the moment to this book. Because to be honest, I have read pretty much every royal book that is out there to read. <laughs> I've read all the vintage ones because years and years ago I was going to do a royal podcast and I was making notes years ago, years and years ago, pre Meghan and Harry even. So I could be a bit of a know-it-all and I could contradict something that Wendy Berry says and I could say, well, actually, blah, 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 blah. But that would be very boring because we want to react to the book in the moment. However, with some comments about Fergie, and I reacted to Fergie because I wanted to give you a laugh because I think it's quite amusing how obviously biased I am when it comes to Fergie. So just laugh along with me. You don't have to take me too seriously. But I did go back and dig out my uh, story from Sarah, Duchess of York, and you'll see I've already made copious notes. Actually, I can share this with you as our next book if you like, because it's fascinating. It is really fascinating. It's such an insight into those times. So if you would like this as the next book, let me know. Vote down below in the comments. If you would like, now I have another one. This one, excuse me, turning away from camera. Um, Diana, Closely Guarded Secret. And this is the one that Robert Jobson wrote with Ken Wharf, who was her protection officer. Now, this is very much in contrast to Wendy Berry because this is very much pro-Diana and it shares some wonderful moments of her life that she can be, you know, a proud legacy, in other words. And we've got this one. So you choose in the comments, which one would you like next? I'm going to do both, but you just pick which one you would prefer me to do next. Okay. Now, the reason why I dug out my copy of Sarah, my story is because Sarah tells us how she felt at that time when she was actually pregnant with Beatrice. I'm just going to put that back because I don't want to ruin my display. Um, and she says how she feels and why and how she actually ended up stacking on all that weight and everything. And you would have to be inhuman and cruel not to feel for her. As my pregnancy advanced, I found it harder to keep the house and staff running. And that refers to financial constraints, which when I share the entire book with you or review the entire book, I'm not going to read you the book because that would breach copyright. But she had uh, a lot of financial concerns, even leading into the births of her two children. Then she was saying, for that matter, it was strenuous to get in and out of the car. Now, this is where I feel for her. The more upset I grew at Andrew's absence, the more I grew in general. I drowned my sorrows in mayonnaise, sausage rolls and smoked mackerel pate sandwiches from Marks and Spencer. Now that combo, smoked mackerel with, and pate in, in, with bread in sandwiches, that's a killer. It's no wonder, Sarah, that you absolutely blew up like a balloon. I mean, that, that is just horrendous, that combo. The food was cheaper than at Harrods. Oh, well, that's good. I'm glad she was economising. <laughs> I got bigger and bigger. My hands and ankles swelled. I felt like an elephant, ugly and grotesque. By the day of delivery, I would weigh 203 pounds. If I was a ship without a rudder before my pregnancy, then I was an enormous Spanish galleon with great billowing sails. Now, this book was actually ghostwritten with Jeff Coplin. So it's very well written. Um, but I presume that a lot of it was from Jeff Copland, the well-written bits. Anyway, it's good that Sarah shared her story. 
So they were actually renting um, a, a house called Castlewood at the time, and this I felt for her. I would walk out to the garden with my little dog Bendix, a gift from Andrew to make me less lonely. Now that's heartbreaking. I would look up at the sky and wonder if my husband might be standing on his bridge seeing the same stars as I, but I knew he was too far away, in barely the same hemisphere, and surely his sky must be different. Let's carry on. Let's carry on. And we're up to chapter 10, staff confidences. And I, I will be reacting to this one, <laughs> probably in a brutal way, at times. Now, this chapter opens up with Evelyn Dagley, who was the Diana's dresser at the time. And Evelyn tapped on the door as per normal with the early morning tray. And she walked in, pulled back the curtains and said good morning, and then proceeded to go into the bathroom to draw Diana's bath, which is pretty much standard routine for all the royals. Now, I'm going to quote you something Diana says, and then I'm going to qualify it with something I think, which is just personal opinion. God, Evelyn, she shouted, what on earth have you been eating? You absolutely stink of curry. Get out and wash your hair, will you? I can't stand the smell, she bawled as she jumped out of bed and made for the bathroom. Yuck, it's revolting. Now, that, of course, according to Wendy Berry, was a horrible reaction, over top reaction. It actually drove Evelyn to tears. But <laughs> being a know-it-all and sharing a little bit, um, I think that it had something to do with Diana's bulimia at the time because even though she was reported to be recovered around this era, I think anyone that suffers from that eating disorder is always wary of anything that could trigger it to come back because it is truly a horrible thing. Although it starts off that you're making yourself sick in the early stages, your whole body's nervous system gets totally skewed and eventually it becomes reactive, even if you don't want it to be reactive. And it can be triggered by all sorts of things. It can be triggered by smells. It can be triggered by stress. It can be triggered by emotional, you know, triggers, it, a whole range of things, certain foods, certain activities, and you know, like I said, smells. So that to me, that over-the-top reaction smacks of someone who was fearful and distressed because maybe it genuinely did make her feel ill, the smell. And then she was probably terrified that the whole horrible cycle was going to start again. And when she was in the worst of that cycle, she was extremely vulnerable because the whole royal family was sort of thinking, oh, my God, what's wrong with this woman? You know, she's basically got a mental illness. She's really disturbed. Is she suitable to look after her own children? No, oh, Paul Charles, you know, the whole thing. She got the repercussions of the illness. So then she goes on to say what super boys that William and Harry grew up were growing up to be. I mean, she just adores these boys. She's got a lot of good things to say about them. And she does make a point in this paragraph, despite what my opinion was or your opinion was or anybody's opinion was or even what Wendy Berry's opinion was in earlier chapters, she says that she did love both boys equally However, one could sense the strong bond between her and William. And at this point, I mentioned last chapter, Ken Wharf, which is in the book that I'm going to share with you at some point, had joined Diana as her protection officer. And the night before, they'd gone to see an opera and it was Verdi's Requiem, I believe. Anyway, they're all in the kitchen and they're discussing the opera from the night before and Ken suddenly gets up, grabs a biscuit from the table and pretends it's a microphone and launches into this funny serenade in a rich baritone voice. Diana collapses into a fit of giggles and William and Harry looked up in amazement. And then he tapped and pirouetted around the floor and he serenaded Wendy and you know, a lot of fun was had. And Diana looked really well and happy and the mood swings appeared to have gone and she seemed in total control. So the arrival of Ken Wharf, someone that she could rely and trust, was a good thing for Diana. 
So Wendy Berry says that later that day, she goes in to deliver some apple juice to the boys and to Diana and they're all on the couch and they're all cuddled up in their jammies and dressing gowns and slippers and they're watching a movie and evidently they're watching a really scary movie. And Diana says to Wendy Berry in a friendly way, oh, aren't I lucky to have my big, strong men to defend me, Wendy, you know, because the movie was so scary. And right in the middle of that lovely, cosy, wonderful time, uh, the then Prince Charles rings, <laughs> which is a bit of a downer when you're in the middle of a great movie and you're all really into it. Anyway, Diana dutifully puts the boys on the line and they talk to Charles for about 10 minutes. And then after they finished, she went on the line and she said quietly, yeah, I'm absolutely fine. Hope you're having a good time. And then Wendy Berry observed she looked wistful as her husband recounted a minor detail about the visit. And she said, well, you're very lucky to be somewhere hot, she said sadly. Good night then. She put the receiver back and tried to get back into the film. But Wendy Berry said it was clear that her mind was elsewhere. So you've always got this push and pull, haven't you? You've always got this Charles at times being desperate and sad and bewildered and you've got Diana wistful and sad and wishing and yearning and you've got the close attachment they both have with their boys and you've got periods of wondrous times and then horrible times. That's what I mean. There isn't, there isn't a villain in this. I'm not Team Charles and I'm not Team Diana. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> okay. So then they have this huge argument. When Charles gets back, it goes on and it's sort of getting on to the one year anniversary of the horrible accident where Hugh Lindsay died in close to skiing. And Diana is in the garden and she's really going after Charles and she's berating him because it's Charles' intention to go back to the scene of that horrible accident, to go skiing again for the season that year. And Diana doesn't want to go and Fergie doesn't want to go. No one wants to go. And Charles is insisting that he is going to go back there. And this is what Diana says. I really don't know how you can go back there, Charles. Are you listening to me? Now, of course, we know that Diana is very close to Sarah Lindsay and providing her with a lot of support and her new baby. So she would be not objective in this situation and very close to the horror of the whole thing, I would imagine. Charles was on his knees digging a patch of soil with a small trowel and his wife stood over him dressed in cords and a wax jacket berating him as he stoically continued digging. Good God, man, it only happened last year. So she goes off, really going off at him. And she's saying, what will Sarah think? What will everyone think? How can you be so uncaring and insensitive? It's interesting that she brought up Sarah, because at that point she knew that Sarah was actually a lot closer to Charles. I've got a hair in my face, sorry. Um, she was a lot closer to Charles than she was to her. So she's dragging out all sort of, persuasive elements, you know, what would Sarah think? What would, you know? And Charles looked up slowly from the plot of Earth and says quietly, Diana, I am going and that is the end of it. I need to go back to prove if nothing else that I haven't lost my nerve there. Now, Diana was visibly upset as she'd read reports of the skiing holiday and she hadn't actually been told directly about it until this point where she got a chance to sort of berate him and try to convince him not to go. And one of the policemen in the staff sitting room that evening said, and I quote, he does exactly what he wants to do, even if the world and his wife are against it. And I do know from reading a lot of books that Charles could be tone deaf. And that is probably why he came across as, um, well, sometimes got really very bad press, even just from things he himself did. He didn't always get bad press because Diana went to the press behind his back and all that. We can't blame everything on everybody else. Sometimes some of the royals <laughs> have to be accountable. And due to his upbringing, he was sometimes rather tone deaf to what the general public and what the general vibe was out there. And that's like all royals, they can all be quite tone deaf. Uh, I think actually Prince William and Catherine are the ones that are the least tone deaf out of all the royal family. And I think King Charles has become marvellously up to date and in tune with the general public since 
he married Camilla. I think that's been a very positive thing. And then Wendy Berry sticks up for the then Prince Charles and says, not his fault entirely, I replied. And the policeman said, no, you're right. It's the system. It's always the bloody system to blame. So the policeman's not convinced. <laughs> so it's interesting to hear the staff criticism, isn't it? Because they're closer to all these main characters. And so when you hear, you know, them mouthing off a little bit, uh, I always like to quote it because it gives us real colour and context to what's going on. So the strained atmosphere continues. It goes from bad to worse. Charles and Diana do a state visit to United Arab Emirates and Kuwait. And I can remember the pictures from that Kuwait visit. They were absolutely horrendous. They were not talking not smiling, not talking. Now, this is interesting, uh, and I underlined this bit to share with you because Wendy Berry shares that as the marriage disintegrated more and more and more and more and more, that Princess Diana was getting closer and closer to staff. Now, I presume I'm guessing that she means Paul Burrell, but she was also very close to Ken Worth, as I have read in that book. I really like Ken Worth. He comes across as such a decent honourable, truthful person. I think you're really going to enjoy that book. And people that are worried about legacy, that Diana's legacy being besmirched, will really enjoy that book. It doesn't wax lyrical about her. It isn't sort of a puff PR piece about her. It's very realistic. But he had a genuine affection, of, affection for her and it comes through and it's very sincere. And it's really, anyway, I'll go back to this book. <laughs> I'm starting to talk about that book. That's another time. The princess was growing increasingly close to certain members of staff, something she did continuously over the years. It was an enviable position for anyone to be in because however close you became to her, you always knew that eventually she would change her mind about you and move on to the next person. Now, we have all known people like that, haven't we? We've worked with people like that. Um, and it's so distressing and it keeps you sort of off an even kill. You never know where you stand and it really results in people working, walking in eggshells around you all the time, doesn't it? Um, when you get that love bombing and then it's withdrawn, it's very, very difficult to sort of navigate. Um, now, Charles kept a sensible distance from all staff. He felt intrinsically that it was not a good idea for the boys to become too close to the Burrell's two children, which gives me the feeling that she was talking about Paul. And he wanted to maintain that social gulf between them. And Diana dismissed his reservations as old fashioned nonsense. After, but he thought, well, no, because Paul is the butler and Maria, his wife, was a former housemaid. And so, you know, he just thought that the boys are princes. This is a direct quote. The boys are princes and should be reared as such, since Charles rather pompously one evening to Diana in the sitting room. And then Diana counted back with their princes, but their children as well. And then uh, another argument ensued. She does go on to say a lovely thing about William and Harry adoring the outdoor life at Highgrove, and she tells us lovely things about that. But she did say something that upset me a little bit. Now, look, I can't handle, I couldn't handle hunting an animal because I can't stand seeing an animal in pain. I don't stand in judgment on other people that do because occasionally I eat meat. I follow a predominantly plant-based diet, but I do occasionally eat salmon, fish, meat. I do have dairy, you know, I use it to make cakes and things like that. So I can't claim any high moral ground. But I, you know, I just, uh, I just don't like seeing animals in pain and I hope that, you know, the ones I eat are killed humanely and they had a humane life while they lived. I try to eat sort of farm produce, things like that, that are, you know, not in horrible factory farmed things. 
hate that, hate that. Anyway, anyway, enough of that. But she does say there was a magpie trap. The contraption was designed to lure the birds and catch them so they could be destroyed later. William and Harry seemed totally unbothered by it, peering eagerly at the frightened birds waiting for death inside. I was unhappy about the trap, but I didn't let on, as I knew that my misgivings would be dismissed as the whinging of a soft townie. It did cross my mind to release the birds secretly, even if they were considered pests. Well, I'm amazed that magpies are considered pests. Uh, we have a lot of Maggies around and we actually, the lady next door to me has a bird feeder thing and she feeds the little baby Maggies. And I'm quite grateful for that because the magpies get to know us and they don't swoop us because they perceive our little neighbourhood to be kind and generous and, you know, they won't, admittedly, they will swoop the postie, <laughs> so, which is awful. Um but they won't swoop me if I go out to the mailbox or whatever because they know who I am. Um, but they will swoop anyone that is a visitor to the street. So actually they're like good guard dogs, aren't they? <laughs> but, yeah, that was a bit, you know, I don't know. I suppose I'm going to get really riffed in the, in the comments down below that I'm an idiot. Anyway, okay, maybe I am. Um, so one of the other things that is interesting that Charles said uh, Charles felt intense joy that his sons could understand and care about country life, but he was increasingly hurt that his reputation was in the papers that he was selfish and remote as a father, and that really hurt him and upset him. And it actually upset the staff too, because they knew that that actually wasn't true. And Wendy Berry then implies that the press were getting these reports and these impressions from someone who was right under his nose. In other words, Wendy Berry implies it was actually Diana giving the press that impression. Now, that is what Wendy Berry is claiming. It's not what I am claiming. And isn't it interesting, the parallels where I've made videos where I've said, <laughs> get out of the house, Harry, the call's coming from inside the house, that the leakings and briefings are actually coming from someone right under his nose. So to finish off this chapter in April, Diana's sisters and their families descended on Highgrove. Prince Charles was away in Scotland. Now, this is where I feel really sorry for Charles. So you know, Diana's sisters and their kids are there. They're having a great time. Wendy Berry says it's very informal. There's picnics and barbecues, people walking around barefoot in the house. And it was just a lovely, casual, wonderful family atmosphere. And then Prince Charles decides to fly in on a helicopter and surprise everybody. And the reaction he got wasn't exactly, you know, joyous, warm welcome <laughs> or a relaxed welcome. As soon as he arrived, this is a direct quote, as soon as he arrived, everyone moved into another slightly more formal mode of behaviour. And he flew in on a whim to join in the fun and to take part with his wife and children. And I feel sorry for him because he would feel the difference in the atmosphere. And that would be an incredibly lonely feeling, I would imagine. And what could he do about it? What could he do about it? Then she says that pandemonium reigned in the house because Tigger had just had a litter of puppies and the prince was deciding what to do with them all. In the end, he justified keeping one, which he named Rue. Was that after Kanga? And the other two were given away to friends. What we didn't realise until several weeks later was that the prince had given one of the puppies to Camilla Parker Bowles. So he named one Rue and kept it, which I presume is after Lady Tyron, Kanga. And he gave one of the other puppies to Camilla Parker Bowles. The significance of the gift, the prince was absolutely devoted to Tigger and allowed her to go anywhere with him. And so the significance of, of this, of these two puppies, was not lost on the staff at Highgrove. And that's the end of that chapter. Okay, the next chapter is chapter 11 and it is titled Separate Lives. But I guess you'll agree with me that they're pretty much leading separate lives at this point anyway. So I guess that's not really a shock. 
but it's still a juicy chapter and I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. Can't wait to see you again. Bye.